Before we get started, let's talk about Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a subscription podcast program available on Apple Podcasts. Members will get access to exclusive bonus content, like my weekly bookmarks, where I talk about how I got a book agent and what I'm watching on TV that week. You'll get uninterrupted listening to many of your favorite podcasts, like Revisionist History, Cautionary Tales, and The Happiness Lab. Sign up for Pushkin Plus and Apple Podcast subscriptions. I think the hardest thing about writing um, a memoir in any form, any length, is stepping forward. It's just like the act of stepping forward. So I want you to understand that what you're doing is also an act of resistance. Min Jin Lee knows a lot about resistance. As a writer, professor, and advocate, she has spent her career pushing back against the patriarchy racism in our community, and encouraging a new generation of readers to do the same. In her writing, Min reminds us not to let the choices we've made for ourselves to be our only story. In her activism, Min gives space to emerging writers, knowing that the path to creating work is filled with roadblocks, especially for women of color. Her career has given us a model to follow, where being your complete self is its own act of resistance. Welcome to Well-Bred Black Girl, the literary kickback you didn't know you needed. I'm your host, Glory Edom. Each week, I'll speak with my favorite authors, makers, and thinkers about how they found their voice, honed their craft, navigated publishing, and showed up in the world. After the break, author Min Jin Lee and I will talk about her early career, how she advocates for young authors, and what she has learned about being an immigrant writer. Min Jin Lee was a student of Bell Hooks, not just in the classroom, but in life. Immigrating to the U.S. when she was seven years old, growing up in Queens, New York, Lee was a young lawyer before she left to follow her calling, becoming a writer. In college, she learned from the one and only Bell Hooks that community and the power of her ethics define how she moves through the world. Like Bell Hooks, Min Jin Lee is encouraging young writers and mentoring emerging artists of color in an industry not built for them. In her acclaimed novels, Pachinko and Free Food for Millionaires, she speaks to the immigrant experience. In her upcoming memoir, she will open the door to her personal journey of self-discovery and how creating the world you wish to live in is within reach. I spoke to Min a few weeks before Bell Hooks' passing. So there won't be any mention of that in our conversation, but you can hear the joy, the sheer joy in Min's voice whenever she speaks of her teacher. I remember the first time meeting you. We oh, were this is at the library. No, no, oh, this wait. was actually at Book Expo. Oh, oh, yes, oh, oh, we were at Book years Expo. Ago. I know. And I remember this was like the, the very beginning of Well Read Black Girl. And I was like so nervous. I was like, oh, I'm going to have lunch with men. Like, what do I do? Like, should I bring something? And you were just so kind and oh. so generous because I was struggling. Like, I don't belong. People aren't going to take me seriously. And you were just like, stop it. You're here. You're enough. And you belong here. And this was in the first five minutes of us meeting each other. Oh, well, you know, it's funny because whenever I see young folks going out there and doing things they want to do, I just feel like, what can I do to build some part of your scaffolding? Because I didn't have so much of that. Mm -hmm. 
in my publishing career. I think that is what keeps you at the forefront creatively and otherwise, because you're thinking in a way that's progressive. It's moving us forward. Oh, thank you. It's so interesting because you're not only a, a phenomenal writer, you're also an incredible lawyer as well. And your trajectory has just had so many unconventional turns. Yeah, weird. Um, <laughs> you, but can we start at the beginning on how you even decided to write this story? How you even changed from becoming a lawyer to being a writer? Oh, gosh, I was I was 25 when I was really unhappy as a lawyer. Wow. And then okay. 26, I was still working really hard as a lawyer. <laughs> and then one day, I got a really super hard assignment after finishing another super hard assignment. I had to build 300 hours in the office in a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I can't do this anymore. And then I wrote my first novel, which got rejected everywhere. I wrote a second novel, which was a precursor to Pachinko. And then I wrote another novel, which became Free Food for Millionaires, which I published in 2007. So I quit in 1995. Mm -hmm. And then I published in 2007, which means it took 12 years to publish a book. So when I seem grateful to have published two books, yeah. <laughs> it comes out of the space of it takes longer for us. Yeah. It just takes longer for us. It takes longer for women. It takes longer for women of color. It takes longer for people of color. It takes longer if you don't have connections, mm -hmm. if you don't have powerful friends. And it's fine. You just yeah. keep going. You just keep going. But what motivated me to write Pachinko, which is my second book, was a story that I heard in college, and I carried that with me. Yeah, I I love the first line of Pachinko. History has failed us, but no matter. And I'm thinking so much of the present moment and mm -hmm. the work that you do as, I mean, would you call yourself a historian? Oh, golly. You know, that's a real honorific for me because I have so much respect for history and for historians. I try to approach it like a journalist, historian, sociologist, anthropologist, and a little bit like a legal person mm -hmm. because I'm so pissed about everything. Like I'm so angry <laughs> about everything around the world because I'm so disappointed. People don't think I'm an angry person <laughs> when they meet me, but inside I'm pissed. <laughs> I just want you to know that behind this smile, I'm really angry because I think things are so unfair. Yeah. I think things are so unfair. And I think it's because I'm so attached to fairness for the world, for everybody. And I'm trying to figure out, well, how does my work as a writer approach that? What yeah. can I do to sort of, sort of create change? And somewhere along the line, I've decided that somehow telling stories, either in fiction or in nonfiction, we can approach a new reality. So even though I'm writing history for my second book, in a way, I'm actually creating a new version of the world that I want. Yes, yes. I, I'm the same way. I really believe in moving towards things that will, you know, impact your life for the good. Because I think that, like, there's something to be said about this responsibility of telling, like, stories when it comes to being a person of color, being a Black woman, and to tell them accurately, right? Yeah. Like, to make sure we're, like, represented in a right way uh, because we know what it's like to have our history forgotten and erased and to be not cited. So in a lot of ways, we are, like, using our writing to correct the historical record. You know, we're th thinking of our collective communities and we're using terms like right of color, you know, Asian American, African American. Um, can you talk about what it's meant for you to really, you know, interact with those terms, whether it's writer of color or Asian American, and to what extent those have been, you know, identity markers for you, or even like shaped how you how you see yourself and how you share your work with the world? I think there are many, many, many writers in my respective community who really hate those terms. Hate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They'll say, don't call me an immigrant writer. Don't call me an Asian American writer. Don't call me a feminist. Don't call me this. And, and I, I understand that. I, I totally understand that. But I, I am an immigrant writer. I am a daughter of a refugee. I lean into it. I lean into it because I like being Korean a lot. I'm not saying they don't. I'm not leaving it at the door. 
Like I'm a Presbyterian. It's like a really weird thing in my community <laughs> that I go to church, but it is who I am. It is the way I think about the world. And I have just decided that that's just the way I work and I like it. I write about Korean people and yes, they're people too, but they're also Korean people. It's a right. very specific thing. You know, I think the way we're understood is something that we can control somewhat but not 100%. Mm -hmm. But I feel a very strong sense of getting things right. I do. I am going to share a quote with you, one of my favorite quotes. Sometimes people try to destroy you precisely because they recognize your power, not because they don't see it, but because they see it and they don't want it to exist. And that is from the one and only Bell Hooks, who is your professor at one point and one yes. of the writers that influences you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, just so much respect for Bell Hooks. What a pioneer of thinking. What a pioneer of intellectual magnitude. And I feel like she really doesn't get the kind of credit that she deserves. Do you have like a memory of being in uh, Bell Hooks's class or anything that you'd like to share with us? Oh, I took two of her classes. So I remember being a young person thinking, my life is changing. My life is changing because I value my thoughts as a thinker. Now, that may seem like a dumb thing for other people, but for me, I didn't see myself as an intellectual. Like witnessing Bell Hooks, Gloria Watkins, honoring our thoughts collectively and individually and thinking about what we said really seriously, you, you start to wonder, oh, maybe I matter. Like maybe the things that I say matter. And it wasn't like when I was a child or even a young person, people walked around saying like, oh, tell me, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't waiting for my great thoughts or my great words. So in a way, to be in the presence of such a great mind, it's really quite an honor. And she was so clear about the brilliance of the literature created by Black women in this country. And, and she made us see the books, not just for what they are, beautiful artworks, but also contextually. And I think that really changed me. It really, really changed me. And I didn't even know I was being changed in that moment. And that's mm -hmm. the power that you have as a great person, I think. Yeah. That was the same like reaction for me encountering Bell Hooks. It was just like immediate belonging. And mm -hmm. then she also allows you to question the things that you don't understand. She is like encouraging you to question your own position and your own power. And I don't think I had done that before encountering her work. Yeah. And the other person who really changed me, and I never met, had a chance to meet her, is Audre Lorde. I, I read her the same time. Yes. There's something to be said about reading something and being completely and instantly radicalized. Like you're mm -hmm. just like, my life is changing through reading this because I can see another way. And recalling those moments as first encountering Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks. As a, as a teacher, how do you then share that information with your students? Oh, what a great question, Glory. What a great question. Instant radicalization, right? That scares people. And I'm like, no, 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 you need this, like you need water and air. And it's not radicalization of the way people think of something scary. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, powerful thing. Yeah. And I want to talk about the importance of Audre Lorde's work and Bell Hooks's work and the other person's Kimberly Crenshaw and the word, just the one word, intersectionality. Yes. Just that one word. If you understand that one word, you can understand why your life is complicated <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how your identities are so complicated. And it's a good thing, not a bad thing. And I can't leave parts of it at the door whenever you just want me to. Yes. I got to bring it in. And I think the way they have advanced philosophy and thought in the world is not being acknowledged. Yes. So you, to go back to your question, how do I share this enthusiasm with my students? Is I say exactly what I just said to you right now, which is, please don't be scared. Please don't politicize it in a negative way, just because you don't understand it. And also because white supremacy prohibits us from thinking about women of color and BIPOC women as philosophers, mm -hmm. as intellectual thought leaders, 
that's going to prevent you from getting your superpowers. Because I always think, hey, you want knowledge. You want knowledge from everywhere. And then you want to give it credit around the globe, not just in a little tiny shelf in a bookstore. I'm Glory Adam, and this is Well Read Black Girl. I'm speaking with Min Jin Lee. This conversation reminds me of a picture you shared on social media a while ago. It's this beautiful black and white photo of you reading on the D train in New York. There's graffiti all <laughs> over the train, and like, you look so cheek. I'm like, she's 15 in this picture. She looks like a model, so amazing. <laughs> um, but what would you tell like young 15-year-old men about the woman you've become, the experiences you've had? What would be the advice to, to her? Oh, I love that photograph. It was taken because Smithsonian Magazine did a feature on my high school, the Bronx High School of Science. And I was one of the kids that they profiled. And I didn't know about that photograph until much later. But in that photograph, and I mentioned this because I think that your listeners might understand, I'm wearing a thrift store coat. Like I paid $15 for that coat. And I was wearing my little Mickey Mouse pin because a friend of mine gave it to me. And I thought I looked so cool. <laughs> And then years later, I read an essay by Bell Hooks about, it was like really like one of these like 700 word essays or something about how she had gone to a country in Africa and she had gone into a tiny hut and it was really spare and clean and beautifully swept. And she said it was like a monk's cell and it, there was so much beauty in it. And then she made this argument that being poor doesn't mean that you don't understand aesthetics or beauty. Mm. Right. So this is the thing that I wanted to say about that image and about being a young person is I didn't have much, but I felt good about myself and I thought I could create beauty even from a thrift store. I thought that I could be cool with my little broken down knapsack, my $15 coat, because in my mind, I was powerful as a reader. <laughs> I was, I was reading a book in Spanish. Like, how cool am I? <laughs> <laughs> I was reading Borges in Spanish. And, you know, it was a free book. It wasn't even my book. It was a book from school. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wearing my dorky glasses. But in my little mind, in my kind of fantasy mind, I was creating me. And I thought, even though nobody knew, <laughs> like, I thought that I could do it. And that's the thing I really want young people to keep. Oh, I love you, Min. I love you more. <laughs> I do want to talk to you about your memoir. I know you're working on name recognition and um, the memoir of visibility and voice. And what how, what is that experience for you right now, writing that and reflecting on your life? Are there moments that you're really honing in on? Is it something that feels edifying. I'm working on a memoir right now and it feels terrifying. So I'm very curious at how this experience for you after writing these two incredible novels, what is it like to tell your own story? Oh, it's really scary. It's really scary, but I write a lot of essays and some people say they're really easy to write. They're so hard for me to write. They're hard for me to write because if you're really honest, you realize that you're going to walk out there naked. <laughs> So when you look at the cellulite of your lives and you're thinking, well, are people going to judge me? And you're like, yeah, some people are going to judge you, but how else will they know you? And I think working on name recognition is all about how do we as BIPOC women feel about being known? Right. And I really wonder what you think about this, Glory. It's yeah, what well, what it is, like you have to really like strip down to your core and you have to be like you said, you have to be messy and you have to be unafraid of being vulnerable. Like it requires you to put your full self out there because when you share the, you know, the story of messing up or failing or taking a risk, like that is what brings people closer. But I've been trying my hardest to really put it all out there in the memoir, like, because I've been thinking of it as a legacy piece too. Like, this is my family story. This is the story my son's going to read. And I guess like the messiest part of my story is definitely like, you know, how I experienced my mom's depression and how that impacted my life and how I 
essentially turned to books as a sense of like healing and therapy. But that's very scary to talk about, you know, but I also recognize how that can help so many people who have been in similar situations or, you know, being like first generation, being the oldest daughter, like all these things, if I'm brave enough to share it, can really help other people. But it is a challenge for sure, man, because <laughs> it's like, it's your life, you know? What you're talking about right now is really an act of service. And I've thought about this a lot, because if you have a love ethic and you have a service ethic, and BIPOC women are essentially trained for service. That's true. However, if you took that idea and allegorized it in terms of our intellectual work as well, in honor and in service to our mothers and our grandmothers, our aunts, who didn't get this opportunity, because Mm -hmm. why did we get this education? Why did we get people in our lives and our communities? How do we create a sense of service of telling the truth about how difficult it was? Yeah. Because what does depression mean for BIPOC women's lives, especially if you are working so hard? But telling that story, Glory, it's so important to recognize. It's also a story of service plus love for your mom. Like we keep thinking about posterity. It's like, oh, this is the record that we leave behind. Yes, that's true. But perhaps that is the record that you need to create in order for you to move ahead. Mm. You're going to make me cry. Because <laughs> it is so true. It feels like it's something that um, I want to not only acknowledge for my, you know, my son and for my mother, but for myself too. Yes. You know, to like write down my complete journey and acknowledge it and move forward from it, tell a new story. Mm -hmm. Um, So it it has taken a lot of time and energy to really even get to that place of, okay, I can say this and I can say this without being afraid. I have a question for you. Am I allowed to ask you a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. How did your mom feel about you writing your book? Oh, man, it's been like in the beginning, because it's been like three years now, but in the beginning, she was very like we were doing interviews and we were going back and forth. And as it's gotten longer, I think she's just like more skeptical. She's like, what are you writing? Why is this taking so long? (laughs) You know, Um, well, you just had a baby. Yeah, yeah, that too. But she she's very supportive. But I think she is um, curious about like what what the story fully will be and mm-hmm. she always reminds me like you know make sure you are telling it from your perspective and it's brought us closer too it definitely has brought us a lot closer i love that i think the hardest thing about writing um a memoir in any form any length is stepping forward it's just like the act of stepping forward so i want you to understand that what you're doing is also an act of resistance it is. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank okay. you for just the, like encouragement and just like the clarity of your voice, because even having your friendship is also so valuable. And it gives me like this. I'm like, I can do it. I can do this. And I can't I can't be afraid of it. And even when I am afraid, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm Minjin Lee, and you're listening to Well-Read Black Girl. Oh, we're going to do rapid fire questions. Oh, okay. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do <laughs> some, some fun questions that are going to be stuck. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. First thing, name three things on your desk. Teapot, um, earplugs, and my Bible. Awesome. What are your top three favorite pieces of candy? I love Snickers. Mm, good one. I also like Mary Jane's. That's a very old school candy. And... I also like Tootsie Rolls. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that's another classic candy. I used to love the Tootsie Pops. Oh, delicious. Okay. What was the last movie you watched? Oh, Eternals. I It's directed by Chloe Zhao. And I was so amazed that she made a Marvel movie, you know? It was quite something. I, I have to see that. I love Marvel movies. Okay. Last one. Favorite birthday traditions? I buy myself a present. <laughs> Is is it like something lavish or is it just like something like you're like, I have to get myself a present every year? I'll buy something really nice. I will. And I think it's because I grew up without having any birthday parties and hardly any presents, like just because my parents are always working and we didn't have money. And now that I'm older, like I'll just go out and get myself what I like. And I think it's maybe it's to stave off being disappointed 
There's a little mm-hmm. bit of that. I'm really worried that I'll be disappointed. I'll be like, I'm going to take care of this by myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm sorry if that sounds unexpected and probably not terribly optimistic, but no, I'm, it's so funny. Maybe it's like the Scorpio in you because I do something similar where I give my – our like our family, we do an exchange and we basically give a list of three things. We're like, these are the three things that I like. And to surprise me, you pick one of the three things. <laughs> I'm going to control my surprise menu. <laughs> right, right. So I'm still surprised, but these are the three things. So we do that every year. That's like how we do our holiday gifts. I We have to do our goodbyes. But I'm I, wanted, I, I, I don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> I know. I know. I literally, I wish I could teleport into your living room. I love you so much. I'm I love so you grateful. I'll make you breakfast, Glory. <laughs> But I also, I'm so proud of you, Glory. I'm really proud of you. I think oh that you're doing gosh. such Thank a good you, thing man. for all people of color. Yep. I do. I don't actually think it's just for our community. Our presence, our visibility, our work yeah. makes a difference for everybody. Whenever Min and I speak, I come away learning so much about writing. And to be honest, myself. Min's love ethic and her care for students, her readers, her community are so inspiring. When I first read Pachinko, I was awestruck by some of the themes she took on, like motherhood and finding your home. Her writing has continued to encourage writers and readers around the world. But what I really aspire to is her honesty. She wants us to get angry, fight the injustices in the world. And she supports us in our convictions. Her writing is her superpower, and we should all aspire to her strength. We'll be right back with one of our well-read Black Girl Book Club members. We love our community. It's what makes Well Read Black Girl such a warm, safe space for so many readers. Right now, we're going to check in with one of our book club members, Petrushka Bazin Larson in Harlem. She is a woman of many talents. She's a member of the Well Read Black Girl community, a professor at City University of New York, and a business coach. Most importantly, she is the co founder of Sugar Hill Creamery, one of my favorite ice cream shops. Welcome, Patricia. Hi, Glory. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Tell me about your experience in the Well Read Black Girl Book Club and how is it different from other book clubs you've been a part of in the past? As a person who likes to read and who has organized her own book clubs as well as been a part of others, what has been so amazing about the Well Read Black Girl community has just been the representation, the quality of books, and the conversations that happen as a result. I am um, always here for a sister circle with people that I know and don't know. And that is exactly the vibe that I have always gotten when being in amidst other well-read Black Girl book club members, when they're sitting around the table talking about a text that we've all read. I love that. It makes me think of Paul Marshall and this idea of sitting around the kitchen table together. That is like the space and the energy we're always trying to cultivate. We want to be in community, but we also want to be in solidarity. Um, Because you are a mother and you are such a wonderful community advocate, how do we get more young people, more young women, more students, just how do we get them interested in reading? The way that we teach is by doing. We don't teach by saying. And so um, how do we get more young people reading? Well, well read Black Girl, Um, right? (laughs) Like having spaces of community around the written word such that it's represented. So just continuing to do what you do, Glory, and inspiring others to do the same. Thank you, Patricia. For more of our conversation, be sure to check out our bookmark series on Pushkin Plus. Thank you so much for joining me. Speaking with Min Jin Lee about being vulnerable, about telling our own stories, and in the process, discovering your own inner strength, it's actually a gift. In the episodes ahead, I'll be speaking with Anita Hill, Jacqueline Woodson, and Gabrielle Union. 
in honor of the incomparable Bell Hooks, whom we lost in 2021, I would leave you with these words from her. When we dare to speak in a liberatory voice, when we threaten even those who may initially claim to want our words, in the act of overcoming our fear of speech, of being seen as threatening, and the process of learning to speak as subjects, we participate in the global struggle to end domination. When we end our silence, when we speak in a liberated voice, our words connect us with anyone, anywhere who lives in silence. Well Read Black Girl is a production of Pushkin Industries. It is written and hosted by me, Glory Edom, and produced by Cher Vincent and Brittany Brown. Our associate editor is Keisha Williams. Our engineer is Amanda K. Wang. And our showrunner is Sasha Mathias. Special thanks this week to Vicki Merrick. Our executive producers are Mia Lobel and Lee Tall Molad. At Pushkin, thanks to Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, Julia Barton, John Schnars, and Jacob Weisberg. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at WellReadBlackGirl. You can find Pushkin on all social media platforms at Pushkin Pods. And you can sign up for our newsletter at pushkin.fm. If you love this show and others from Pushkin Industries, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. And if you're already a subscriber, make sure to check out my exclusive bookmark series on Pushkin Plus starting on February 18th. You'll hear extended interviews with book club members, bookstore owners, and more. And you get to hear what's on my mind, what's on my radar. And of course, what's on my reading list each week. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen.